Hey guys, welcome to the shop. This week, I've got some lathe work, I've got some cutter grinder work, and I've got some torch work. We're going to be doing a little silver soldering, trying to repair some inserts that go in a base mill that you can't get anymore. So we're going to try to, you know, keep this tool from going to the scrapyard, I guess. And all this is viewer stuff, stuff that viewers have sent in for me to repair. People who've supported the channel need a favor. So I'm trying to get caught up. So thanks for watching, guys. Let's get started. So I've got a piece of 6061 T6 aluminum that's inch and three quarter or 44 and a half millimeters for the metric guys. I need to turn this into some spacers for a buddy of mine, Ronald Notch. He's a supporter of the channel. He's helped me out uh, definitely in the past. Sent me the Smith torch and then some other stuff on top of that, which was really nice. And all I'm doing is returning the favor. So what we need to make is at least 10 spacers that are inch and 5 eighths on the OD, inch and 3 sixteenths on the ID, and then a thickness of 3 sixteenths. So they're just rings. For the metric guys, that's 41.2 millimeters by 30 millimeters by 4.76 millimeters on the thickness. Now, I'm going to go figure out my kerf on my parting blade, the material that I'll need just simply for the pieces alone, and then what I'll need to hold in the chuck. I'm going to make a quick drawing because it helps me not make stupid mistakes even on a simple part. Try it may actually help you also and then we'll go over the lathe and try to burn these out real quick. So I went over to my high speed steel drawer to look for a parting tool to do this job with. Nothing that I had fit for the job really, so I just decided I'd grind one out real quick. Something like this doesn't take very long with a cutter grinder, especially when you're dealing with a piece of half inch steel. And uh, I'm glad that I did. So ground half the tool, put some layout fluid on it, marked out where I want to grind to next. This doesn't have to be a super precision tool, just going to be a parting blade that's all but I want it to be symmetrical and I want to make sure that I can indicate off the side of it so I'm coming in straight that's all you know you could do this on a bench grinder but I can remove material just as fast basically on this machine almost as I can on the bench grinder and uh, with a half inch tool you know it doesn't take much uh, time to grind so I'm just gotta, where I flip the tool now I just gotta reverse my relief so I'm just putting one degree on each side, minimal relief, one degree on each side of the tool so it doesn't rub on the sides, and then towards the back, two degrees. So, simple. So I've got my fixture swung around. I need to ground the end of this. So I just ground the sides so it has side relief so it gets thinner towards the bottom. It's got back relief so it's widest out here at the point and then thins towards the back. I want to grind this tool in a fashion to where when I part off my small pieces that it doesn't leave a burr on the piece that comes off the lathe. So I'm going to be grinding the end at a slight angle to try to achieve that. So I need to put front relief in it. So we'll put, I don't know, probably four degrees roundabout. Probably about right. Now I'm going to tilt it. Let's see, I want, this will be the leading edge. So I want to tilt it away. And I'm going to do probably, I don't know, three degrees, four degrees.
So there's a look at the tool. Put a little back rake in it, about seven degrees. You can see the front there. That should leave a burr on our part, or on the stock instead of the part, hopefully. But nice and symmetrical. I just gotta knock uh, the little rough edges off, the burrs off, polish that edge, and then be ready to use. I went just long enough on this blade to where it'll come through our part and not rub the back. You know, no reason to make it any longer and flimsier than it already is. And any chips that come off this, you know, are just waste that go into the chip pan. So any wider than it needs to be is just unnecessary. So we're just going to quickly face this and then turn the OD down to an inch and five eighths. Just WD-40 in a spray bottle for this aluminum. Raise my tool up a little. Just clean up cut. We're at one seven three four. So we got about I don't know, it's about a hundred thousandths to go. So I'm on my final pass here, just checking it to make sure that I'm where I want to be before I cut the whole thing. And I've been a half thou, which is good enough for what I'm doing.
nothing moves the material like a drill. take a quick break from the lathe and I'll give you an update on the wife's little Kia, the totaled car that we rebuilt a few weeks ago. It's been doing pretty good. We've had absolutely no problems with it other than a little shimmy in the front end and it felt to me like it was coming from that driver's side front wheel. So I decided I'd switch front and back tires. The front tires were good on it. We never changed them. Back tires we put new ones on it. So I wanted to see if that took care of the problem and here I find why that we've got such a you know, shimmy in the front end and it's because this wheel is pretty badly bent so that was kind of a bummer to find but I just figure it'll be fine it'll have to be until we can get another rim for it or you know a whole set of wheels so we're just gonna stick it on the back for now I had a viewer ask me I don't know, a couple weeks ago, if I had torqued the lug nuts after I used uh, my impact driver on it. And to be honest, I've never torqued a lug nut in my entire life. I always use a half inch drive breaker bar and a good socket and put a few grunts in it. It's always been good for me. So, no, I've never torqued a lug nut in my entire life. enough. So there's our rings. It's easy enough. Worked out really well.
finished up. I stuck them in the little lathe simply to to burr the ones that I actually forgot to do in the large lathe before I parted them off and hit them with some scotch Bright to uh, shine them up a bit. Now, if I had to make any more of these, maybe double this amount or 100, whatever, I would have ground this tool in a way which it basically already is, other than it's a little longer than it needs to be, to where when right before this thing parted off, the radius is in the tool up near the front to bird both pieces. And then all I would have been left with is one inside edge to the bird. Save some time, maybe in the long run. But there you go. Drawing wasn't absolutely necessary, but uh, if he needs any more of these, I've got it in my notebook, and he won't have to send me a drawing. Helps me anyway. So, there you go. Turned out really good. So here I'm making a gasket for a heat exchanger that I don't have an old gasket to go by. Uh, I'm making a new one out of this piece of PTFE or Teflon, and I need to get these in internal features into this gasket, and then I want to share with you how I do it. Now I usually just take a piece of notebook paper like this, hold it stationary onto the gasket face, and then rub the image onto that piece of paper, and then that gives me a good good stencil to go by. I'll show you a little more of how I do uh, some of the internal cutting in just a minute. So depending on the material that you're using to make the gasket, its thickness, it can be pretty tough to cut out by hand. And all I'm doing here is just tracing the outline of the template you know, with a razor onto the piece of PTFE. I heated a razor blade and bent it to the radius that I needed. You just can't hardly cut these out by hand. They're just too thick. And this is normally the process or similar to the process that I'll go through to make all sorts of gaskets. I'll often get a gasket that's got a two-week lead time from the manufacturer, and I've got two hours to get this piece of equipment back up and running. So this is just what I do in some situations, and it definitely works. And I uh, figured I'd share it with you guys. Alright, so I've got three inserts here that go into a large face mill. The date on these is the second month of 1973, so they're substantially older than I am. And you can't buy these anymore. These were sent into the channel by Tom Fleming, and they go in a large face mill. And without repairing these, which are pretty, pretty unique, really, um, the whole setup's junk. I guess that's a tool steel body with a brazed-on carbide chunk there for the cutting edge. These are all busted up pretty bad and you just can't they can't be repaired other than putting on some new carbide so that's what we're going to try to do also want to share with you some kit that was sent into the channel for my smith for my whole cutting rig and then uh, we'll try to raise on some new carbide tom's a really good guy he's a big supporter of the, all the youtube guys i'll put a link to his instagram up here let's go get the torch set up with the new kit and then we'll try to float off this old and put on some new so here's my welding rig, cheap Harbor Freight cart, which is good for the money. The tires really suck on it, but I can deal with that. Then whatever I can throw together, basically, to make my welding rig work, regulator-wise. One Victor regulator that was thrown away from someone else's kit, another regulator that was leaking and needed rebuilding, 
and then gauges, at least on this regulator, that are cracked, but work. So, you know, patched together, but it does work. Now, I was sent two new regulators and two new backflow preventers, or flashback arresters. I want to show you why the new regulators that I was sent are better, and why you possibly may be interested in some yourself, and uh, show you the extra kit that was sent in for my Smith torch, which I really appreciate. Always use the right tool for the job. Alright, so some of this kit, not all of it, was sent in by two different people. One is Vernon Courier over at the YouTube channel, The Mature Patriot, so go check him out. He sent me in two uh, cutting and brazing tips for the Smith torch, along with this large goldenrod oil can, which you've probably seen me use. I've been using it now for several weeks. Definitely a good brand. I've got the smaller version, which was also sent in by Vernon. And um, if you're in the market, I would suggest one of these. They're pretty good, really. And the large one's nice. You don't have to fill it as often, and I like that because I'm always seems like I'm always filling the smaller ones. Now the rest of this stuff was sent into the channel by Robert Eaves. He's got an eBay store. It's Bulldog under, underscore Equipment is his username, and then Bulldog Equipment is his store. He sells welding supplies and stuff. Some of this, all of this stuff, is either scratching down or used. These regulators are awesome. We'll install them and go over their unique features in just a second. And also want to show you some of the unique stuff that he sent that I bet most of you have never seen before. I know that I haven't, but I'm sure some of the some of the older guys have seen it. But anyway, some backflow preventers, flashback arresters. I always call them backflow preventers. Anyway, let's get these installed. We'll go over this kit and then we'll do the job that we need to do. So these regulators are really awesome and they got some neat features. One is that the gauges are built into the regulator itself. There's nowhere for them to leak, you know, really other than the factory connection. So that's an added benefit. Plus, you can't knock these off and, uh, you know, cause a leak in your shop. These gauges also have ranges where you should set them for welding, cutting, or heating. It's all nice and uh, already made in there. And also on the high pressure side, it has where your tank is safe or full and then where it's, you know, it's starting to get empty. So you don't have to know all this stuff right offhand. You can look at the gauge, know you're within a acceptable range, and adjust from there, which is really nice if you ask me. These are Victor Edge series. And one thing that I commonly see working with students or co-ops is that they'll put thread tape on regulator threads or any fitting on a regulator, really, most of them. Now, the old ones, you had to put tape on the gauges, but when you have a tapered fitting like these, or two matching tapers, there is no thread tape required. In fact, that can cause them to leak. If these leak, it's because the taper's bad, or you're not tight enough, not because they need thread sealant. It wouldn't do any good to put thread sealant on this nut here. You still have a direct leak path in between the nut and the, and the shaft here. So, the nut and the shaft. So, there you go. Go over to Bulldog Equipment and show him some love. I really appreciate these gifts. Um, you know, they're awesome. I wouldn't have them otherwise. Every time you mess with them, a quick leak check because you'll come back and you'll find that you have empty cylinders because you will forget to turn them off. At least I know that I do. A little soapy water. Bad out oxygen. And acetylene. That's not good. So almost out of oxygen in the middle of the yellow there. That's nice about these gauges. And I'm not settling basically right at the red, so probably got this job left. There goes a hundred bucks. So here's something I've never seen before, and that's a cutting tip that's at an angle, 
like for flush cutting rivets or something off of a large tank you can imagine the old rivets or bolt heads whatever that you want to get right up next to the material and then cut straight down and not risk cutting into the material like you would have to with a standard head so I thought that was neat I had never seen that before and I'm sure some of you guys have but it's new to me that and along with this tip here that goes in the actual cutting head of the torch replaces this tip here and it's made for welding I guess really short it's neat uh, probably pretty rare I would say maybe both of these so I thought that was cool we're going to use this SW201 for our brazen job it's the smallest welding end that I have should be more than enough heat for the little parts that we're going to be doing Oh man, that's nice. Look at that. You can see that. So I just turned up this heat a little bit. I don't want to overheat this thing, but I also don't want to, you know, not heat it enough or heat it too long. There we go. It breaks free. That's it. It's off now. I'll clean up that seat and prepare my piece of carbide. So I recently, probably a couple months ago, surface ground my railroad track anvil, top and bottom. Makes it much nicer. I'm just going to take some of this Harris Stay Seal 50% silver solder, cut me off a couple chunks, and then hammer them flat. That way I can set them under under my pieces when I go to solder them together. I did clean this, although it looks dirty. Alright, so some Superior 601 brazing flux is what I'm using. This is, uh, I believe it's actually a little lower melting temperature than the Harris Stay Silv Black. There is my silver solder. I'm just going to lay that on there and uh, flux the bottom of this. Yeah, that's the way it goes. And I think that should work, hopefully. Bottom and the back. So that actually turned out all right. Looks like it bonded well. Probably, you know, if I was doing a bunch of these, I'd have to come up with some sort of fixture because I dropped that actually like four times. So at the moment, all I've got is one wheel hub for my actual surface grinder. So I just decided to throw my little mag chuck that I have up on the cutter grinder and use it to thin these inserts down a bit. The carbide that I brazed on was a little thicker than the original and I just wanted to get them down to an all, all even thickness. Now this wheel was really coarse and it's got a slight unbalance which using on this real light machine shows up pretty bad which I'll show you in just a minute. It worked. All I needed to do was grind these things down and then I give them a good final polish on the on the hone, so that's the way I thinned them out, just on the cutter grinder. So I dressed the wheel with this dresser here, and that's about as good a finish as I'm going to get with that wheel. I tried to balance it, I can't get it any more balanced than what I've got it, and uh, you know that's a coarse wheel, so those long striations are just from the rough wheel itself. 
but there is some uh, some hopping in there, some wheel hop from uh, just an imbalance that I can't get out. So that's probably about as good as I'm going to get. Now I can make this much better just by polishing it on the diamond hone here, which is what I'll do. But uh, that's that's what I got. You know, I got a, a finer wheel I can try, but this is good enough for what I'm doing. So I'm going to be using one of my favorite grinding fixtures here. It's just a multi-axis grinding vise. You can pick these up off eBay. At least you used to be able to. And you can also use them on a surface grinder. So if you want to do some tool grinding on your surface grinder, uh, this will allow you to do it as long as you have the clearance to use it. It is kind of tall. But what we're going to be doing is grinding a compound angle here. We're going to work the top of the tool here. We're going to be grinding relief behind the cutting edge and below the cutting edge all at the same time. I've got a lot of excess carbide there that I've got to remove. I probably could have scored it and broke it off into the vise to save myself some grinding, but I really don't. I don't think that's a very good practice. You can put uh, micro fractures in your carbide and uh, cause yourself some issues in the long run. And all I did to measure the angles that are in that insert, this original, which I'm going to replace even though it doesn't appear to be broken, simply because it probably has some cracks in it. Um, is this little protractor. So I just measured my angles. This is, you know, close as they need to be. And then dialed them in my fixture. So this shouldn't take long, a few minutes. So there they are, pretty much finished. Got a decent finish on them. Need to spend a little more time on the lap and get them polished right out to the edge where it, where it really matters, I guess. I did, before I started, I sent Tom some pictures of the carbide that I had, noting that they were a little short and he didn't care. And all the cutting takes place out on this, this end anyway. So it should work fine and uh, save that face mill from the scrap pile because without these very specific inserts. That's really all it is. So there we go. I'm, I'm happy with the outcome. Well guys, that's it for me this week. It's been a really stressful week for me. My wife Elizabeth's been in the hospital a couple times with some heart issues, which we don't think is anything serious, but of course we take that stuff serious and, and want to find out what the deal is. But she's fine right now. But still, you know, that'll stress anybody out. So I just want to say a huge thanks, all of my viewers. I appreciate it. I look forward to your comments and you know, just interaction every week. Huge thanks to my viewers, patrons, subscribers, all the people who've supported the channel in any way. We appreciate it, but more than you know. So that's it this week. Thanks for watching, guys, and I'll see you next time.